Welcome. In this short video, we're going to talk about a key macroeconomic measure, the gross domestic product, also known as GDP. The gross domestic product is a measure of output. And this measure of output is really used to compare economies across all different nations or within a nation over time. Specifically, GDP is the total value of all final goods and services produced in a country in a given year. Now that's a mouthful here in measuring output, so let's take this definition apart and see what's involved. Start with the total value. So basically we're going to add up in the United States the dollar value of everything produced. And this adding up the dollar value of everything helps us to compare, say, apples to haircuts. In other words, we can't just count everything because you really can't compare pounds of apples to the number of haircuts, for example. So in other words, by putting everything in a dollar value, we have a uniform measurement. Also, we're looking at final goods and services. Final products, not the inputs. So in other words, we count the car produced in the United States, but not the steel produced in the United States that makes the car because steel is an intermediate good. And if we accounted both the steel and the car, we'd be double counting. The car price in the United States already includes the value of all the inputs that went into the car. So counting both the steel and the car would actually be double counting. So we're looking at final goods and services. Also, it means we're not counting secondhand goods as well. Secondhand goods that were produced in a prior year are counted in that prior year. So again, counting them again would be double counting. Produced within the country. So GDP counts goods produced within borders. So Toyotas, Corollas that are produced in Ohio, are in the U.S. gross domestic product. A General Motors van that's produced in a plant in Mexico would not be in the gross domestic product. And when inputs are made elsewhere too, we also have to make adjustments in the final product as well. But we're counting goods produced in the United States. Not necessarily the ownership of the factory, but we're counting goods produced in the United States. So the components of GDP, to measure GDP, there are two approaches. One is we can add up all the expenditures, or on the other hand, we can add up all the sources of income in the U.S. economy to, cal to calculate U.S. GDP. Let's start with the expenditure approach. So in the expenditure approach, we have several components. The largest component in the expenditure approach of GDP is consumption expenditures. Investment, government purchases at the federal, state, local level. And then finally, we put in the rest of the world, exports minus imports, and we call that net exports. So let's look at each of these components in turn. Start with consumption. So personal consumption expenditures are usually categorized in terms of durables, um, such as a washing machine, non-durables, for example, toothpaste, and then finally services, such as getting a haircut or uh, taking a class. Investment. So investment here, as an economist defines it, is not uh, what you might think of. So when you think of investment, maybe you're thinking of stocks and bonds. That's kind of financing. That's not really what an economist defines investment. Investment refers to the purchases of firms, in particular plants and equipment, inventories that a firm has, and residential construction. So the constru construction of homes that people live in is also under investment. Existing buildings or financial assets would not be calculated in an investment measure in a given year. We're looking about new plants and equipment, new inventories, new residential construction. Investment historically is the most volatile component of GDP under the expenditure approach. In other words, it's the one that fluctuates the most and frequently fluctuates. Government purchases we're talking about all levels of government, federal, state, and local. And we're talking about the purchase of goods and services, snow plowing, defense contracts, library books. Those would all be examples. Government purchases here in this category is not talking about transfers, because transfers are really about in the income approach. So transfers such as Social Security and unemployment, 
that's not really an expenditure on new goods and services. It's, as the name says, it's a transfer. So Social Security payments are a transfer from the payroll tax revenue to Social Security recipients. So it's not really talking about something new that's being produced. So we're looking at purchases of goods and services by the government at all these levels. Final component, net exports, refers to the difference between exports and imports. So exports are what we produce and sell to the rest of the world, imports being what the rest of the world is selling to us. So we take that net figure for our gross domestic product. Really since the 1970s, the United States exports less than it imports. So net exports have really been negative since the 1970s. So all those components would give us GDP under the expenditure approach. Alternatively, we can also calculate GDP with an income approach. The largest category here would be wages and salaries. We'd also bring in corporate profits, proprietor income, which is sole owner type income, farm income, rent that comes into landlords, interest income, sales taxes, and the depreciation of plants and equipment. So we add these all up together and we should get GDP using an income approach. Theoretically, the income approach and the expenditure approach should give us the exact same amount. When GDP is measured quarterly, four times a year by the federal government, typically the income approach and the expenditure approach are going to give us some slightly different numbers. Because in measuring the U.S. economy, it's so large, there's bound to be some measurement error there. So GDP is a handy measure of output. It's sometimes used to measure kind of the wealth uh, of a nation, but there are limits to gross domestic product and what it's actually measuring. So GDP is only one measure of well-being for a nation. So nations with a larger gross domestic product are sometimes considered to be better off than nations with lower gross domestic products, but there are limits to this measurement. There are other factors to consider in terms of what means well-being, and there's factors about what GDP is counting and what GDP is missing. So let's think, look at these issues in a bit more detail. Other indicators of well-being, crime rates, education, health, leisure time, quality changes. Those things aren't necessarily factored into GDP as an indication of well-being. Also, income equality might not be factored in either. So, for example, the U.S. has the largest gross domestic product in the world, but in terms of health, we don't have the highest life expectancy. Our infant mortality rate is a lot higher than countries with lower GDP. So, in some measures of well-being, we're not at the top of the list. Environmental issues in GDP are also going to be a problem. Increased production could increase GDP. So, for example, increases in energy production in the United States would increase the gross domestic product. But with energy production often comes pollution as well, and that's going to affect well-being. GDP doesn't fully account for that. Also, there's an issue of what is measured and what doesn't get counted. Uh, in the underground economy, we're talking about the production of goods and services that are happening, but they're not counted in GDP because they're not really reported. So they sort of happen under the radar and we don't count them. Why would they be unreported? Well, some of it's illegal activity. So we can imagine all illegal activity created to drug production. You know, production of methamphetamines isn't really reported to any official agency, so it's not ending up in the GDP. Also, ca tax evasion. People that work for cash to avoid having to report it to the government, those services don't get reported. In the United States, it's estimated that the underground economy is probably about 10%, the size of 10% of our gross domestic product. That's a significant understatement of economic activity. However, in other countries, often with higher taxes, the size of the underground economy might even be much larger. Some estimates in Canada put it closer to 20%. Final non-counted thing is this non-market work. Non-market work refers to unpaid work. So it's work that we might value in a household, but no one gets paid for it. So again, there's no reporting mechanism for us to measure it. Housework, child care, that can be non-market work that while we value it, we don't really pay for it, so it doesn't get counted. So for example, consider this, if I do my own laundry, that's not in the gross domestic product. 
me washing clothes for my family, folding, whatever. It's just not there. But if I sent my laundry out to a service and hired someone and paid someone to do that laundry service, all of a sudden that's going to be reported in the gross domestic product. In other words, we're talking about the same set of services. If I do it as unpaid work, it's not there. But if I hire someone to do it, it's there. What's the significance here? Well, GDP understates service production. All these services we produce in our home don't get officially counted. On the other hand, if people enter the workforce and start hiring people to do services they used to do themselves, GDP goes up. We're not necessarily better off. It's just that now it's above the radar in terms of these services, where before it was under the radar.